so welcome to the Innovation Factory Grand Finale. Grand Finale. Okay, so hope you guys uh, enjoyed today's program. So basically, this is really uh, going to the end today, but uh, this is a very, very interesting session, so I bet you guys will not regret being here until the end of this program, I'm sure. Okay, my name is Josh Choi from the ITU. I'm managing the Innovation Factory program, which is the UN-based uh, startup pitching acceleration program uh, under the Pillar of AI for Good initiative, which was designed to help AI startups uh, scale up and their solutions globally and to achieve the SDGs. So since its launch in 2020, uh, we've got around uh, more than 300 applications from uh, 40 different countries, and we selected five best teams among all applications for the last uh, three years. And they will compete today to be the number one of this program this year. So all the finalists today will have a due diligence opportunity, which will be sponsored by Reg Capital, a Canada-based VC. And once they complete the process, they will have an access to an extensive network of investors and then also business partners across the globe. And also, some of our judges will have the uh, metric session with the, uh, the startups to help them uh, raise funds and also to expand their business across the globe by using uh, their uh, novel AI solutions. And the winner today will get a gold membership of the uh, National AI and Cybersecurity Information and Sharing Analysis Organization, which is 25,000 US dollar value. And uh, they'll have a full access to the whole the programs. And also, the, uh, the winner will be also highlighted in ITU blog as well. So one last thing, the audience here also can vote for their favorite team. So the winner of this public vote also will be also highlighted in the ITU blog as well. So we will show the QR code later on. So you can actually scan the QR code and to, to access the link of the voting and then choose your favorite team and they will be fun. All right. So now I'm handing over to today's MC, Ms. Jennifer Woodward. Please join me a big applause for her. So Jennifer, stage is yours. Thank you, Josh. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. So uh, my name is Jennifer Woodard. I'm an AI entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a company called Inside Intelligence, and I'm doing lots of moderation things here uh, today at AI for Good. And I wanted to introduce you guys first to our judges, um, sitting all here in the front row. First, we have uh, Stephen Ibaraki. He's chairman of Reds Capital. Stephen, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? or Can we get Stephen a microphone, please? Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, AI for Good is the biggest event in the world today. It's, it's transformational. It's hosted by ITU, so just a real pleasure to be here. And I work with uh, over a million CEOs, investors, and scientists in my daily work. So thank you again. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we have Carlo Torora Braida de Belvedere, and he's founder and chairman of Totora Braida Institute. Hello, yes, uh, thank you very much for having me over. I'm absolutely thrilled to be again uh, on the judging panel for AI for Good. I'm the executive chairman of the Totoro Brada Institute and uh, also therefore the executive chairman of the National AI and Cybersecurity Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. And I'll be very glad to uh, support the processes today. Great, thank you, Carlo. And then we have Adria Dunn, she's founder of Vine. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. I'm actually an AI startup myself out of Miami, Florida, and I created a robot that is a social impact platform for world leaders to connect in a safe space. Awesome. Thank you, Adria, for being here. And then finally, we have Mustafa Gado. He's a venture developer at Creative Doc. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I, I do uh, work as a venture developer with a Berlin-based uh, corporate venture building company. We help uh, corporates bring innovation on board. I've been in the startup and venture scene for over a decade, working with startups in multiple domains. Thank, thank you, so you Mustafa. Thank you so much for being here. So I just wanted to start with kind of the rules of the road. Uh, so we're going to go with, you know, we're going to start with a pitching session. So each startup will have four minutes to pitch, and then we'll follow up with eight questions from the judges right after that. So we're going to start with our first pitch. It's from Breeze Technologies. So do we have Breeze Technologies here? Hi. 
So Breeze Technologies helps environmental managers in smart and green municipalities to monitor and improve air quality by implementing sensors, gathering real-time data that are a 1,000 times cheaper and 50,000 times smaller than traditional monitoring solutions and recommendations from more than 3,500 clean air interventions. And this is Robert Haneke, who is the founder and CEO of Breeze. Welcome. You have four minutes. Thank you for having me. My name is Robert Heinecke. I'm the founder and CEO of Breeze Technologies. We work on one of the greatest issues of our time, air pollution. I don't think you, uh, I think you know this picture. This is how New York looked like just one or two weeks ago. And this really underlined, air pollution is according to the World Health Organization, the greatest environmental health threat of our time. And many of you are also affected by that. In fact, nine out of 10 people globally are living in areas with too high levels of air pollution. But do you know that? Exactly. One of the greatest issues is the lack of data. And that comes from that uh, the current monitoring technologies have been built in the 60s and 70s and not really been mon modernized since. Cities have these big, bulky monitoring monstrosities and only a handful of them, if at all. And we changed that. We made air quality monitoring 50,000 times smaller and 1,000 times cheaper by moving most of the complexity into the cloud and supporting it with AI. And that enables us for the first time to provide ubiquitous air quality data from the whole built environment. We bring this data together in a centralized cloud platform, our environmental intelligence cloud, where then anybody, you don't need to have a scientific degree uh, can understand this data and turn it actionable. In fact, for instance, we bring the decision makers in the municipalities, in the communities that we are working with, insights and intelligence from cities worldwide. We built a database of more than 3,500 cleaner actions that have been implemented globally from Mexico City up to Tokyo. And we know how well they have performed in the past and what their success criteria were. And we use artificial intelligence to match make the most efficient and effective ones that are going to be the best impactful ones for your local realities, for your municipality. Um, and then in the second step, we also help to actually use the data for other use cases. For instance, supported by the US government, we built an AI that can detect the patterns of wildfires in real time in those data sets, enabling us just in a couple of minutes after initial burn to alert first responders and extinguish the wildfires before they turn the sky orange. So how do we use AI? We use it for both um, uh, calibrating the data from our sensors. We use it then also to help turn the data actionable and figure out what to do to improve air quality and then even avoid bad air quality in the first place by, for instance, detecting wildfires, which is also why we've just been awarded by UNESCO's IRCAI as one of the most uh, 100 excellent projects worldwide for ethical use of artificial intelligence for the sustainable development goals. Now I want to talk about two of our use cases. The city of Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, is using our solution to, for the first time, drive their cleaner action management themselves. Previously, they had to rely on state-run air quality monitoring and management infrastructure. And this data now helps them to do urban planning, to do mobility planning, integrate it in their smart city efforts, and in turn, improve the quality of life of their citizens. And secondly, the National Park in uh, Harz, the one of the most important national parks in Germany that had a fire every year throughout the whole last years um, with their big forest areas. They are relying on us to protect their forests since just a few weeks ago in Germany. So we already have a broad network of customers and supporters all over the world, but still, we need your help. If you know anybody that is responsible for air quality, the environment, or quality of life in cities, please contact me. And if you work with smart cities and smart regions, please also do contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Congratulations on that amazing project. So now we move to the judges. Judges, you have eight minutes to address uh, Robert. Uh, so who wants to start? Stephen? Stephen. Can we help Stephen? Yeah? Okay. Uh, what's your revenue uh, situation right now? Are, are you profitable or, and uh, 
when do you see profitability and how large is your customer base and what's the rate of growth right now? Yeah. So um, our revenue situation, so we are profitable. We never raised outside funding from equity investors, so we are fully bootstrapped and we've been profitable since day one. We've been mostly relying on actually revenue from our customers also to develop our products. Um, we're currently doing seven figure euro revenue, so in the millions, uh, growing year by year uh, around 100%. And uh, we currently have something like uh, between 60 to 80 cities and other public institutions that are relying on our technology. Thank you for pitching. Uh, what is the cost of customer acquisition for you? Yeah, since uh, that, that is a bit of a difficult question, you know, we mostly serve the public sector, so uh, typical uh, engagement time before actually winning a contract is depending on the customer between one to three years. So um, the customer acquisition cost can also range from just a few thousand euros up to 20, 30,000. Uh, I see that you have a relationship with Microsoft as a partner and also NTT. What is the nature of those relationships? Are they part of your go-to-market strategy? Yeah, exactly. So with both of them, uh, we are working with their smart city teams on uh, bringing um, our solution as part of uh, basically overall smart city packages to the customers because you know we are really good at air quality but we know that cities don't only have air quality as an issue so definitely you want to integrate a vertical air quality solution into a horizontal smart city platform and this is exactly what we also prefer when working with larger cities what is your um, big picture vision for the company and also what inspired you to create it in the first place so um, back in 2014, before Breeze Technologies was around, um, I was living and working in Istanbul. I was there in winter 2014, and whoever has been in Istanbul in winter already, they have a big issue with air pollution. They have heating from coal uh, inside of their apartments still often. They have huge traffic issues, also during the summer, by the way. And, but they also have inversion weather, which means that the pollution that gets created in the city doesn't really go away. So at some points of my stay there, I could barely see the other side of the street anymore. The pollution was so bad. And that for me was the first time where I realized air pollution is not only an issue in New Delhi and in Beijing, but everywhere around the world. And digging deeper, I was really frustrated with the st uh, current state of affairs in monitoring and the lack of data that we had to actually make cleaner action uh, data driven and not an experience science as it was back then. Um, and our long-term vision is to exactly do that. Ideally, in 100 years, nobody needs us anymore because everywhere on the earth we have clean air. But to get there, we first want to create transparency about the status quo of air quality worldwide, basically for every spot. And to that end, also right now with the German government, we're building uh, Europe's first data hub for air quality data, where anybody that produces air quality data can funnel that into, make it either available for free or also turn a revenue from that data itself. And the long-term idea of that is that we don't necessarily need the buy-in of an individual city anymore to, um, to fund an air quality monitoring network, but that we turn the monitoring networks themselves profitable by selling the data to real estate, sports, health, and so on. And then it's just a kind of five to six year investment, uh, return on investment if you build, for instance, a monitoring network in a city like Paris. Great. Any other questions? Do we have Mustafa? Have yeah, we do. Okay. So uh, you mentioned earlier that the, the objective behind your, your, your startup is to monitor the air, the quality of air, so governments or would interfere whenever there is a problem. Um, and, and as you know, this is a global issue, so I, I mean, there are no borders for this. So how are you planning to take this to emerging markets, uh, considering, I mean, the, the, the solution looks like, I mean, it's a bit heavy or expensive, so how are you planning to take this to more? I mean, it's a thousand times cheaper than traditional monitoring solutions. So you have emerging markets, like for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a huge lack of data. And one of the issues for that is that the governments there cannot afford to put out $2 million for just one monitoring station that they put somewhere in, this, in the center of their city. So actually, this technology is perfect to build first efforts in, in gathering a baseline, which then in turn can also, for instance, inform public funding programs. Like, I know that the World Bank really likes 
likes to see uh, data underlying whether the actions that they put out have an actual impact or not. And this can benefit this. And so we already uh, we are working with the UNDP right now. We're listed in their digital X catalog for solutions for sustainable development. And we're trying to get into other uh, efforts like this to also bring our solution to emerging markets. Peru is actually one of the first uh, countries now in the global south where we are starting a project in just a couple of months. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, how are your sensors, your IoT sensors, how are they secured from uh, cyber, potential cyber attacks? Uh, so, of course, you know, if you have physical access to the device, it's, it's hard to secure. Um, but they authenticate themselves uh, with our cloud infrastructure and also the other way around if we do over-the-air updates. And also on the side of our cloud infrastructure, we constantly do uh, pattern recognition both for the health of the sensors so we can recognize when sensing elements start to deteriorate but we also look for tampering or other malicious uh, uh, malicious data so we do that uh, kind of safety net we do that on the side of the cloud not necessarily on the IOT device itself okay thank you breeze technologies can we have an applause for Robert and his team great okay Next team, second team is called Rupka, and Rupka uh, automates healthcare and AI and ro robotics. It's autonomous robots trained with convolutional neural networks perform intricate medical tasks, hello. And their flagship product called Arthritis Ultrasound Robot, also known as Arthur, automates assessments of rheumatoid arthritis, which is a chronic disease with substantial burden and could lead to irrevers irreversible bone erosion in six weeks if not treated. So we have here Johannes Scharhoff. He's the CEO of Rubka. Welcome. Thank you. Four minutes. Thank you. So I guess it starts now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Robka is uh, transforming healthcare with the use of AI and robotics. We are at the intersection of those and we use the synergy between robotics and AI for our benefit. Okay, there you go. Okay, the reason why this matters a lot is because rheumatoid arthritis is a heinous disease. It is a disease that only affects 1% of the population, but it is actually one of the heaviest disease burdens of our time. As she mentioned, after about six weeks, you have already the onset of uh, irreversible bone erosion. And typically, um, one in three workers can't work after only five years. It affects women three times more than men and greatly disadvantages them at, in the workspace. 40% of the patients in Switzerland reported that it took more than two years to diagnose this disease. This is totally unacceptable and leads to terrible um, quality of life and really ballooning healthcare costs. The issue here is that we diagnose the disease way too late. The drugs are actually there, even inexpensive drugs are there, but we just find it way too late. That's why we attack the problem head on. Arthur is the first autonomous robot, and autonomous can't be s stressed enough because it is packed with AI. It uses AI to detect all hand shapes and sizes. It uses AI for quality control and to find the right anatomy. And then lastly, it uses AI to grade the images. So it's all automated, and it is a plug and play solution. We believe that when we use alpha and triage, so stratifying the patient's priority, we can double the patient load that can pass through a system. And we've most importantly already tested alpha and patient acceptance, and there were 92% that wanted alpha as part of their routine. The business model that we have is a hybrid model where we want to sell alpha and then have a subscription model with an overrun. It's also important to have a service agreement because we want the customer's goals and our goals to be aligned for maximum uptime. The technology here is, is fantastic. There's, there's tons of AI in this, in this product and it is truly unique. There's nothing like it. The market for rheumatoid arthritis is also really, really big. We only looked at work automation in this calculation and I can go into details if you ask. 
in terms of the competition, there is only competition, like real competition from the status quo. So people performing ultrasound scans manually. There is also palpation, which is not objective and is also not scalable. And then the only scalable solution is this thing down there, and it has reached some adoption, but not mass adoption. There have been numerous products trying to solve this because the problem is huge. We have several hospitals committed in Denmark. We currently have actually four that run, run the product, and we are in negotiations with several others and some of the leading names in Europe. I'll skip this. We have an awesome team here, yeah? We have a CTO who is uh, world-renowned uh, in the robotics community for building healthcare robots, and is also a professor in imaging in healthcare. We have a published and peer-reviewed rheumatologist in our team. And then when the CE mark was on the horizon uh, at the end of last year, I joined the company, and I have extensive experience in medtech. Yeah, we won a lot of awards. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Rupka, amazing work. Thank you so much. So it's time for our judges. Who would like to begin with the question and answer, answer session? Stephen? Oh, uh, same uh, sort of question. Uh, where are you in terms of revenue? Do you have annual repeat revenue? Uh, what's your profitability? Where are you in terms of the funding cycle right now? Uh, we are currently actually raising around. And in terms of revenue, we got today the news that we uh, got, got the funding for the first purchase in a hospital. So you know, recurring revenue is, is not high at the moment. We are at the beginning of our journey. That's, but to have recurring revenue, we've picked a hybrid model um, where we align our interests with those of, a, of the customer. Um, yeah, I, th I think that answers the question. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on that question. With the funds raised, um, how will they be used? Um, the funds raised are going to be used to have more installations. So we're going to hire some uh, sales resources, but actually mostly, again, engineers, because the critical thing when you set up a robot is that it has phenomenal uptime and that the people at the site are happy. So we need to be there and we need to make sure that those installations and the training associated with it are flawless. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your uh, supply chain planning? So if uh, you suddenly get um, you know, significant demand for this product, uh, you know, are you comfortable that you can uh, uh, scale up for that? Yeah, we are actually comfortable that we can scale up for that because we are using off-the-shelf components. Um, we're using the uh, KUKA, KUKA arm, as maybe some of you have recognized. And KUKA had some, some supply issues in, during COVID, but they have largely eased. And KUKA has been very, very supportive and has let us know that, uh, let, that, that they would support uh, faster, um, uh, faster times um, to deliver their arms to us. So we are on the radar. We won their prize as the MedTech Innovation last year and at the Medica, largest healthcare conference. And uh, we won the, the Robots for Good grand finale here already, which was sponsored by KUKA. So KUKA has been very, very, very supportive. I think they believe in this. Papa? You mentioned earlier that the total addressable market is a $1 billion. Uh, is that in Europe? Global, US? No, we looked at, um, good question, uh, we looked at the, the United States, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, and Australia. Okay. And the way we calculated the market is that we looked at prevalence and incidence. So with prevalence, you know, how often do you have the disease? Uh, there is typically four, well, we calculate with three visits a year that you need to monitor the disease because it's strong drugs that you take disease-modifying drugs that shut down your immune system. Yeah. And then we looked also at prevalence, so new cases. And what is normal is, and we've been, well, we had that confirmed in Denmark and in Germany, is that 18 patients arrive at the rheumatologist's office sent by the GP, and one has the disease. So we could calculate on studies how often does it happen, how many visits do happen, what time is used, how much automation potential is there. 
related to that point you mentioned earlier that uh, this disease at one percent in the world population would would get the disease so yeah just from a sales perspective do you think this is a vis feasible market in, in, in yes. that and and also uh, again this is a more of a b2b business because you're dealing with hospitals more mostly so how long your sales cycle look like yeah so um, the first answer is yes because it's a chronic disease if it wasn't a chronic disease and these patients would just be treated once and then would go away it would absolutely not be feasible to have this product so the, the unfortunately the chronic nature makes it attractive um, and with the sales cycle so the sales cycle is of course longer as it is with all bigger capital goods in hospitals but um, I think we have so far really good traction so I, I I'm often surprised here after working in medical technology for 12 years that cold calls by me are returned in 24 hours by luminaries in our field so there's a lot of interest and the people are also often committed to go the extra mile to find funding even for a test which in my previous job working for a big major was unheard of so yes it's it's taking long i think the sales cycle is between at least half a year to a year I have one more question. Yes. Uh, where do you get the data for the AI? Um, originally, we got the data from various studies that uh, the rheumatologist had done in the past. And then since we've been like conducting studies where we generate images um, and then use those to train the AI. And in Denmark, the, the good fit, well, the bad and the good thing is we have a state system. So when you, when you, when you can agree with somebody, you can typically agree with a larger patient population you don't have to go sort of doctor by doctor I have one last question um, what's the training burden on the hospitals to use this machine yeah so there is some training um, because uh, we want the machine to be autonomous and to you know the patient and the robots to do, to do to do the work but we do need to train uh, a receptionist or a medical student or somebody there to help with the first visit because the patient in the first visit is prone to making some simple mistakes. But since most patients are chronic patients and therefore return customers, it is, I would say, similar complexity to a photo booth. If you use it once, maybe it's a bit confusing. If you use it four times a year, the photo booth is not going to be a challenge for you. We have time for one more if anyone wants to take it. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, marketing uh, ideas? What, what, what are the two or three main things that you'll want to do to ensure that it's going to work? I think for us the most important um, uh, marketing is using those key opinion leaders, those luminaries in the field. That's also why we currently mostly focus on university hospitals or large hospitals and not you know, private small players. I think they are, the, they are the people that drive change down. And we, what, what we need is a change in the mindset. We need to change how people think about this. And therefore, we need these strong, opinionated people in our back. So that's the, that's the number one activity. It is also important, I think, to put out a lot of content. And we try our best to do that. So we have studies, uh, patient reports, everything out there. Um, for people to see it and, and to use it. Because we are a too small org organization to constantly send out PDFs by email. Yeah. OK. So congratulations, Johannes, on your project. Okay. That's Robka. Let's Thank give a you. round of applause. Thank you so much. So we're moving to our third team, which is called Prometheus. So Prometheus provides an AI-powered medical imaging platform for healthcare professionals, it's called Aldont. And it's especially for developing countries to bring better healthcare for patients, and this is Hyun Jin Bae, and he's the founder and CEO, welcome. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hyun Jin uh, from Prometheus. I believe that most of people in this room have X-ray images taken in your lifetime. Such diagnostic imaging is very essential part of medical care to examine your body's condition. However, more than two-thirds of the population in the world does not have a proper access to diagnostic imaging. For example, uh, 14 African countries does not have radiologists at all. 
the lack of radiologist means delayed or missed diagnosis, and then makes lower quality of care for patient and wasted uh, social cost. For example, in the US, about 70 billion US dollar is wasted for every year. Okay. So we try to solve this problem with our medical AI cloud called Adent. Adent is cloud native platform to overcome all the barriers. It brings cutting edge AI solutions everywhere patients seek care. The Adent, Adent has three major benefits. First, it's very affordable. It does not require extra money. And second, it is accessible. The users can use on their web browser. And third one is uh, remote collaboration. Users can share their images to their peers in using our data sharing and real-time communication function. We provide 10 plus cutting edge AI solutions so far, uh, trained with millions of data uh, with to, to analyze various uh, images. One of the examples is bone suppression solution for chest texture images. It removes all the bone shadows on chest X-ray images to make clear the lung lesion within five seconds. So this is the original image. And let's count five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, voila. So all the rib bones have gone. So doctors can see and find the early symptom, early lung disease on your chest X-ray. Uh, so as a result, doctors have more confidence when they read the chest X-ray images. So we are now developing the smartphone app the, for the healthcare professionals without digital X-ray devices. So it will have the low to middle income countries. The market is huge. The total market is 36 billion, and the accessible market is 3 billion US dollar. And we are targeting 1 billion US dollar, and we have very strong strategy and team members to penetrate this market. The first, we provide our agent as a premium SaaS service to healthcare professionals. Second, we provide our individual AI solutions to imaging device company. Third one, we communicate with national health authorities to make use of our platform. So uh, by doing so, we are targeting 1 million users at the end of 2026. We already have more than 10,000 users worldwide by collaborating with global institutions and hospitals. And we are world-renowned team members, uh, radiologists, AI researchers. We, our mission is to make healthcare more accessible and affordable for all. So please join our journey to make healthcare more, uh, to bring better healthcare with the AI. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Hyunjin. Aidant. Thank you so much. So judges, eight minutes. It just so happens uh, my group has invested in this kind of technology and we're finding that adoption is a real problem. Um, there seems to be some resistance from medical professionals and so on. So how are you addressing that? Uh, okay. And that's reluctance. Right? Okay, so uh, we uh, developed this solution in collaboration with the clinicians in real world clinics. So they understand the, uh, the problems and unmet needs in the real world clinics. So we believe that we can penetrate and we can communicate with the real world clinicians uh, to make use of AI solution in the real world. So uh, currently uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the agent, we have uh, communication with the Medical Doctors Association in Peru. So they are uh, now acquired on our platform. So that's why we have 10,000 members. And then one, one just add on, what's your financial situation? What's your annual repeat revenue? Are you profitable yet? When do you see profitability? Okay, so this uh, Aiden is um, a freemium SaaS service. So it means it doesn't make lots of money at this time. So we are expecting about 4% of it, uh, uh, conversion rate after we uh, embedded uh, the, the, 
the higher uh, payment options. And also we are selling our individual AI solutions to the uh, medical imaging company and also uh, the packed company. So in total, we made a revenue about 2 million US dollars in South Korea. And we are expecting uh, this year about 2 million. Uh, yep, uh, medical AI can be prone to biases. Do you have varying data sets? Yes, uh, we collected, uh, we tried to solve this problem uh, by collecting uh, as many of data from the world. So we collected uh, mainly from South Korea, but we also used the uh, data from the outside, the, like uh, including the Peru, on the, uh, on also uh, from the public uh, uh, available data to train our model. Carlo? Yeah, I'd like to ask about uh, partnerships. What partnerships uh, do you think will be absolutely crucial to ensure the success of your enterprise over the next uh, 18 months, let's say? Thank you. Um, so I believe that our ADENT platform is targeting the uh, mostly the public sectors uh, um, rather than the private sector. So we want to have from the uh, institution, the private sect uh, public sectors, uh, like um, um, the investment from the uh, impact fund, uh, having impact fund, and also having uh, like a, um, uh, like a Gates Foundation. So we are uh, expecting some collaboration so to make use of our platform and expand uh, this solution to the world. Okay, Mustafa? So you, you mentioned already that you have 10,000 patients or 10,000 customers mm -hmm. uh, across Asia, Latin America, and yes. others. So I'm curious to know how do you do your sales in other markets? I mean, it looks like you have a good team, but it's all South Korea based. Yes. So how do you deal with the expansions in international markets? And, mm -hmm. and how are we planning to expand to more markets, particularly emerging markets, as you mentioned earlier? Yes. So as we uh, have a conversation with uh, uh, hospitals and doctors in the emerging market, and they are most concerning about the infectious disease, uh, including the tuberculosis. So uh, we uh, luckily have a solution for the infectious disease, including the tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis. So um, we want to um, provide the solution to the public se uh, public sectors on our platform, and 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 we have a strong team members. Uh, we uh, recently have a, a business officer from uh, the company called Lunit, uh, which is one of the unicorn companies in South Korea. And we know and understand the, how to penetrate this market. And we try to understand the uh, unmet needs of doctors. So we uh, believe that uh, in the coming years, we can adapt this platform to the emerging market, the low to middle income countries. Okay. I have ahead. a question to piggyback on that. How, um, speaking of emerging markets, how difficult is it um, when they don't have sophisticated IT to implement your software? Yes. Um, as you're concerned, um, the, the infrastructure is a problem uh, in uh, emerging market. But uh, we uh, understand that they at least using the mobile phone in, uh, on the hospitals or at home. So our platform is affordable uh, even on the mobile network because we are only dealing with, uh, mostly dealing with the X-ray uh, images. The X-ray, uh, the single X-ray image is only like uh, less than 10 megabytes. So it can be handled on the mobile network. So we believe that if they have at least mobile network, it can be uh, um, used uh, nationwide. And also we are um, using the uh, reliable private cloud vendors like AWS or Microsoft Azure. And they already have uh, uh, the data centers for each continent. So we are, uh, we are vendor neutral uh, platform. So we can uh, uh, apply our platform to anywhere in the world. Any other questions? A uh, quick one. Uh, in uh, some uh, many African countries, imports, uh, duty, and taxes make uh, a big difference on the actual cost of a product. Mm. Um, how, is that a major consideration for you, or do you think it's not going to be a problem? 
Um, could you repeat the program again? Uh, import tax and duty on... Uh, uh, import taxes? It, yeah, on many African countries uh -huh. make pro foreign products prohibitive. Yes. Um, so I think our platform is uh, based on the cloud, on the cloud. So it's a SaaS solution. So I think it's quite uh, uh, easier to deal with uh, compared to the real product. So uh, we can, we believe that the, uh, by collaborating with the uh, uh, local distributors of a SaaS solution, we can uh, penetrate the uh, markets in the Africa. Okay. Okay, so Hyun Jin from Aiden, thank you so very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, we're moving to our fourth team and our fourth team is SenseGrass and SenseGrass is actually gonna join us virtually. Uh, SenseGrass is a soil intelligence platform that reduces excessive carbon emission and pollutants from agriculture through a patented AI agronomist analytics platform. And we're joined by Lalit Gautam, who is the founder and C C CEO of SenseGrass. Please welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Awesome, awesome, great. Uh, just a logistic check before I start. Can you see my screen and can you hear me loud and clear? Try to sp speak just a little bit louder, please, Lalit. Oh, sure, definitely. Uh, so, uh, shall I start? Yes, go right ahead. Cool. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, because of the health and logistic issues, I have to give this presentation virtually. Uh, you, I'm sure like everyone in the room eat food, right? And if you can see your food in every day, you look at the food looks very shiny, very fresh as well. But unfortunately, we have no idea internally what is the nutrition and the carbon value of the food looks like, whether the food is really useful or not. Because of the lack of data and the lack of tool, the agriculture industry being one of the oldest industry. We're wasting a lot of resources on the excessive resources. We're using 65% of the excessive fertilizer as well. Uh, unfortunately, what happening under the soil and what the food nutrition looks like is a very conventional way to find out. It's a complex, expensive, and lengthy method. And at the end of the day, you only get a data. So data without solution is not a problem. Uh, Everyone, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lalit. As I mentioned, I'm the we building this soil intelligence platform for the climate change. After two years of research and patent, we have designed and developed this first AI agronomist platform. That's uh, you know that gives you a very precise recommendations to lower your input in carbon uh, value, but also increasing the yield and profitability by providing a very precise high-end AI-based recommendations. Uh, let me tell you how the product works behind the scene. So we are the first company who use four types of property data sets. The first one and the major one is our own patented carbon and the nutrition soil sensors, which you can see on the left side. This comes into the two versions. The first is like the plug and play device. And the second is the first world first soil autonomous testing rover. This, the soil data coming from below the soil, uh, that includes the nutrition value, carbon value, almost 12 parameter. And this, we combine this below the soil nutrition and carbon data with the hyperspectral imageries, climate data, and the user input data. And goes to the second component, which is AI agronomics, and calculate hundreds of ideal data points to provide a very precise recommendations to the corporates to make decision making. And of course, the corporate shares with the farmers as well. So you can see this is a B2B SaaS platform, manage millions of data points, and whenever something changes in the field, it starts giving you recommendations at a very high level, very you know uh, advanced AI level to save your cost, but also increasing the yield, which means we are reducing the input cost and the carbon and nutrition fertilizer value, increasing the overall food productivity, and also providing the profit to the farmers and companies. Uh, as I mentioned, you have seen a lot of ag tech companies working on the NDVI and satellite imagery. We all call ourselves as a more soil intelligence and climate analytic companies. Design and develop the first AI economics like ChatGPT, optical spectroscopy carbon and nutrition soil sensors, and one of the most affordable prices for the small to mid-scale farmers also make us one of the most innovative company in this segment. Uh, we have been just two-year-old company 
one year in operation and seen great response. We are generating 20,000 USD MRR, but over $1 million sales contracts in our hand as well, which we are planning to deploy in the next crop season. Some of the large companies we are talking right now, and these are all also in our sales funnel as well. Uh, we are not just a very high tech company, you know, bringing the business and the profit to the uh, to the to the clients and to the stakeholder. But we are equally social impact and responsible companies to focus on some of the uh, SDGs as well. La, late, your, we your time is up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we are third generation farmer, and that's all from Sensegrass. Thank you, Thank Lalit you so from Sensegrass. Round of applause. Hey, judges, what do we have for Lalit today? Hello. Hi. Um, have yeah, you? Hi. I saw that you said you were having some conversations um, with some large companies. Have you secured any contracts or have anything um, MOUs or anything written? Yeah, sure. So we we have uh, we ha we already have signed the shareholder uh, the sh uh, the channel partnership sales agreement with Cisco uh, for the entire Southeast Asia. The Cisco usually are our channel partners. Those who providing uh, they usually work with the governments for all the smart agriculture products, and they we are their only uh, solution provider. Uh, then we also have you know working with the uh, Corteva, and we also have like you know signed this as well. The third large contract is almost 850k USD onward uh, with, a, with, with a southern Texas company uh, growing the uh, the largest apple and uh, the walnut grower in the southern uh, America, which is our core market. So we are focused more on the specialty crop, high cash crops uh, with the corporates and the governments. Um, I have a related question. Um, you mentioned Cisco is uh, acting as uh, a uh, channel partner. Uh, surely you mean uh, uh, partner Cisco partners will act as uh, the Cisco partners that work in agriculture will be your channel partners or what do you actually mean by that partnership? Exactly. No, no thanks for asking. So it, it gives me to clarify the question. So we usually have two go to marketing strategy. The first is the direct sales where we directly selling to the company like PepsiCo, Cordeva, Monsanto, so on. And the second is our channel partners. So. Technically, we do not go to the farmers directly, and Cisco is a kind of channel partner who usually work with the large governments um, and and the other private companies as well. So, so, just to like long story short, these are channel partners who buying from us and and delivering and supplying to the to the governments or the other corporates. Okay, thanks, Mustafa. Uh, Lalita, I just wanted to thank you first to join us, uh, even virtually. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you're depending or relying on public data uh, in, in, in your AI solution. And from my understanding uh, that you were operating in some emerging markets, including India and other markets, and as by my understanding, the public records might, might not be the best in, in, in similar uh, markets. So how, how are you avoiding uh, the lack of data or the, the less accuracy or efficiency of, of data in such markets? Yeah, Mustafa, this is an important question. So if you see agriculture or climate is one of the oldest and I would say the old school industry, right? Still people doing manually a lot of things and it's impact our climate and environmental a lot. So actually we're doing two ways, you know, to tackle this problem. We sourcing a very personalized data as well. So of course, our data science team sit down with the manual agronomist behind the scene and we break down this uh, system in this way. Let's, let's take an example of actual sheet where we have a lot of millions of columns. So a lot of time we capture the publicly available data, which is not trustworthy a lot of time and also missing as well. And then we purchasing and buying the data as well from the corporate, from the you know, private institutions as well, and make these models as well. So last thing, just to, you know, just to close this question is, we really need very personalized data sources like sensors, and the IoT device, right? Because if you really want to build an infra infrastructure for the agriculture, we have to implement a lot of devices, not just from us, from any other company. In agriculture, it's been very slow and very outdated as of now. So I think it will, in the, in the next decade, you will see a lot of active and a lot of climatic companies focusing on this segment. You will find a, uh, a lot in the market. Okay. And then what is your growth rate uh, over the past two years from a uh, customer acquisition standpoint and then from a revenue standpoint? And can you project one year into the future? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, due to the time limit, I did not, you know, share the financials and the projection. So, uh, our month-of-month -month growth is almost 24 percent, and in the last, eight, like in the last year-by-year -year growth, I would say the 80 percent. So, uh, we are projecting a 1 million or 100k MRR, which is 1.2 million ARR by the next year end, 2024. And this is also the year where we're going to raise Series A round as well. Uh, and the end of the 2023, we are somewhere touching the uh, 600, you know, USD, which is more than half million kind of uh, sales. And next year, we are also planning to become a break even because we have a small team, but we're focusing more on the subscription based business model. Okay, Adria. Hi. Um, what are some of the challenges when it comes to regulation in different countries? And also, also, is there any other uh, risks in your business plan that you are looking to mitigate in the future? Yeah, that's that's a very important question. So I think uh, there are many challenges. I think the the, the product we are building is a very, uh, I would say, innovative in terms of nutrition and carbon and PK salt sensors, right? So I think. It required us a lot of funding and efforts to do the R&D. Now, educating, this is also a effort. But I think the most important part is hardware required. It's a CapEx-intensive business, right? It's an OPEX-intensive business. And a lot of time, like, you know, you have to scale. If you really, it's like a chicken and egg problem. So when you scale, when you need a very personalized data, you also have to put a lot of sensors in the field as well. So that's the reason we're going with the B2B and also channel partners. Uh, the second is the regulation which you have mentioned because a lot of time when we work with these companies and a lot of things the the, the data regulation is a, is a very critical and i think one missing point in this industry is that large companies the governments do not have data to filing their reports and esg's report as well so we can in future we can also provide and we can also serve, solve this regulatory or policy uh, based challenge hey carlo last question in uh, terms of geography, what countries are you going hit, to be hitting first and why? Uh, we're focusing more on the, uh, you know, the more developed countries in terms of the agricultural infrastructures like U.S., Latin America, and Europe, where we are 80, 70 to 80 percent, uh, you know, revenue and clients coming from. The reason is like, you know, because if we, as I mentioned, we are B2B companies. So we're targeting all the large agro corporates are coming from these countries, even they are working there or even they have a headquarters. So even if I have to work in India with PepsiCo or Cargill and Corteva, or if I have to work in Africa as well, it's, it's very easy for me to do the initial trial and test first the US and Europe, and then eventually with the same company, I can go to India and the other developing nations. Okay, great. Lali, thank you so much for joining us from home, and we wish you could have been here with us, but loved your presentation. Thank you. Sense grass, thanks. But, thank you, everyone. So it's time for our final team. Yes. Our final team is called Ultrasound AI, and they are informed by more than 5 million ultrasound images and thousands of pregnancies. Ultrasound AI's AI-derived forecasting model has the potential to radically change prenatal care by identifying women at risk for preterm birth. And we have here today Marissa Fayer, who's a vice president at Ultrasound AI. Please approach the stage, Marissa. Round of applause, please, for Marissa. Thank you. Last but not least. Three minutes. Four minutes, sorry. Four minutes. Four. I'm just waiting for the slides. Oh, I guess I control them. Can we get Marissa's slides? giving away all the good stuff. No worries. All right. There you go. Ready? Great. Okay. Thank go. you. Hi, everybody. I'm Marissa from Ultrasound AI, where we are visualizing the future of prenatal care. A baby shouldn't have to fight for its life on day one, and a mother shouldn't have to figure out when the baby is going to be born. Prenatal care around the world, but especially in the US, is broken. But this is most imperative for us because we want to ensure that prenatal care around the world is changed and improved. Unfortunately, 400,000 preterm births occur in the US every single year, and around the world, 
Over one million babies die every single year due to complications related to preterm birth. Unfortunately, also 80% of babies born with preterm, or preterm, which is 37 weeks or before, um, have complications due to their health. And that is incredibly costly to the healthcare systems in any country that you're living in. So what Ultrasound AI has done, we've uh, created an AI software technology that layers on top of existing ultrasounds. This is not a hardware, this is a software solution that uses the, the ultrasounds that are already being taken by the doctor, either in a hospital or a clinic, or in a more developed region, a developing region, with point of care ultrasound. So this can be layered on top of any ultrasound software technology. <laughs> what we do is we don't look at one singular area, which is typically what's used right now. What we do is we look at eight anatomical areas of which cannot be visualized through just the naked eye. And so we, using the AI technology, look at eight anatomical areas and create a forecasted delivery date, which is able to predict preterm birth. And this happens immediately. This is not something that needs to be sent out like a blood test, which is currently the only other way to predict preterm birth. This happens when the mother is sitting there with their doctor, with their nurse, with their clinician, and they can find out immediately if there is a risk. If there is risk, if there is potential preterm birth, a doctor could administer whatever they do, whatever they need to do, and there's multiple types of solutions for multiple types of issues, and they can administer those and start them immediately. For me, this is personal. My niece was born at 26 weeks, and thank God she came out screaming, because otherwise, she probably would not be here today. And my, my sister-in-law went to the doctor's office that morning and was told everything was fine, and that evening, her placenta detached. If she had our technology, she wouldn't have to deal with that problem. This is delivered straight onto clinical workflows in the PACS, and it enables real-time information. And this is not just in theory. We are a pre-revenue company, so I'll uh, get that question out of the way. We are pre-revenue, but this is already developed, and we are in the FDA submission process right now. So, I already said that it uh, is real-time results. We are anticipating that patient outcomes can project it to be improved by 33% and reducing healthcare costs by 25%. This is a $30 billion problem just in the US alone, and we're working to solve that. We have a great management team. We are very much patent protected. We have about 25 different patents that protect our uh, technology. Preterm birth is our first indication we are already working on about six others where this technology can be applied. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Ultrasound AI, very impactful technology. Okay, Carlo, looks like you, no? Steven, who wants to start? So, um, uh, you're protected by patents, but you know there's there's so much work done in imaging right now and, and AI application to imaging. So, how can you ensure that some competitive force out there isn't going to overrun you in some way? Let's say Nuance uh, looked at this, or CVS, uh, CVS Health, which is the largest healthcare company in the world. Uh, how how do you? prevent being overrun by some of these competitors? Well, actually, we'd like them to purchase us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there, I mean, in general, there's never any way to protect it. We have, yeah, you know, we have multiple t patents that is uh, in the US, and we file them internationally. That's the way we protect ourselves. Um, everything is a trade secret that we are filing to the FDA. Um, and th uh, honestly, we just hope that they purchase us. We're also planning to integrate with the large OEMs, you know, with the ultrasound manufacturers, with other software companies, and so obviously a lot of that's protected under our agreements. And the hope is, uh, you know, in 12 to 18 months, they uh, somebody purchases us and let them fight it for it. Just one other thing. Uh, so, what's the market validation? You must have gone out and surveyed, you know, 100 doctors or whatever, and they said, yeah, we want it. 
Yeah, because right now, the only way that a doctor can predict is with the blood test. So they want point of care. Every other, every other healthcare so solution has something that's immediate that, that AI is, pr is uh, looking at. Right now, uh, there is nothing for preterm birth because honestly, nobody wants to, to play around with any solutions related to a pregnant mom. And so uh, this, is, this is what they want. Every, there's been over 90% uh, people who have said that they want this and we already have doctors in, you know in trials working on this We've trained the algorithm with over 5 million images. We've also uh, have been running all of our validation studies on 4,000 uh, uh, pregnancies Hi there. Hi. First of all, I'm gonna say I'm so excited. There's a woman on the stage. Yay. Yes And wearing pink for women. Yay. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna clap for that. I have two questions that I've written down here. Um, FDA in the US with AI yeah. um, isn't fully fleshed out yet, and yeah. how do you navigate this challenge? Yeah, so we've been in discussions with the FDA. Actually, we uh, recently just filed our 510K, and they've pushed it back to actually uh, push it to de novo, which is, uh, means that they're in conversations with us, and that was their suggested recommendation. So, I mean, listen, only 17% of, FD of uh, AI solutions are being proved by the FDA. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we've been in discussions, and they've been talking to us and give us all indications because we've done the data. We've done the clinical validation work where a lot of these other technologies haven't. So. There's never, I mean, truly, there's never a guarantee, but uh, we've been in discussions with them for, you know, for over a year. Our company's been only in existence for a year and a half. So we started this process early, and they've been very supportive based on the data that we've been giving them. Great. I, I have one more question also. Um, what does your reimbursement model look like? Yeah, so there's existing CPT, CPT codes for this. So as soon as we get approved, we're able to be filed under these CPT codes. Um, there's some for AI, there's some for just a preterm birth. We can actually piggyback probably off of um, the blood test ones as well. So that's the reimbursement. The other side is we're going to be baked in eventually, and you know, once we have clearance, to um, the imaging solutions. And so the doctors just, you know, they're using the ultrasound. This is another add-on technology. So there's about four CPT codes that are applicable for ours. Um, I'd like to ask again about the strategic alliances sure. and partnerships. What, what are the... Uh, well, uh, the ones that you'll need to bake in before you can really say that you'll be ready to launch and be successful. Yeah, so we want um, several of the strategic OEMs who, for ultrasound manufacturers, who we are already in strategic discussions with. Obviously, we need our FDA clearance um, until they, think they can sign an agreement, so that's what we're waiting for. But um, they're all in trials. They've all evaluated the technologies. They're all pretty senior level discussions. So that's first and foremost. We'd really like to um, you know, speak to the likes of the Gates Foundation because our intent is not just to have this in the US. This is a global scale. We are already, we already did this on a medical mission in Ghana. We're already in some significant discussions with both um, um, India and Ethiopia. Um, to have some of their clinics already using it. I personally do a lot of work on the global, global health scale, and I, this, this is a global technology because it can be used especially point of care, and that's what we did in Ghana. We went to prove that this can be used on a handheld ultrasound, that it's not just one of the big standalone systems. So first and foremost, the OEMs for the ultrasound manufacturers, we want the strategic large nonprofits um, the Gates Foundations, you know, AI for Good, you know, everybody to be able to help us scale this instantly and globally. This is, that is the only reason we founded this company. Hi. Hi. So you, you mentioned that you did some trials in, in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, did you get any endorsement from big hospitals, uh, university hospitals? I mean, that's number one. Number two, you, uh, you've been in the process of a year with F to get the FDA approval. How long further are you expecting it to happen? And have you raised any money so far? Yes, of course. Okay. So um, first question, did I lose it? Uh, sorry, I got I mean, yeah, We're talking about uh, endorsements. Endorsements, yes. So um, we've done several trials with the University of Kentucky in Kentucky in the United States. It's a very diverse population. Uh, we published several papers with them. We've presented at uh, the maternal fetal medicine um, conferences, so we've received endorsement from them. Um, because we're not cleared yet, no hospitals are really able to use this on a revenue bi basis, so you know we're, we're waiting. Um, as far as capital raised, um, we have already raised $3 million. We're raising another $5 million um, for scale right now. If we raise more than the five, we can scale even larger uh, globally. So um, anybody who has a checkbook, we're waiting to talk to you. And um, The process. The, 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 the FDA approval. The How FDA long approval process. We anticipate approval um, in January of 2024. 
So just a few months away. Unfortunately, it uh, takes 120 Not days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Time for one short question. Anyone else? No. Okay. Great. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. A round of applause for Marissa. Ultrasound AI. Okay, so now it is time for the judges to deliberate. Uh, you're going to come back in a bit and you're going to tell us uh, <laughs> your decision. So uh, in the meantime, I'd like to open up an audience Q&A. You guys have been listening to all the pitches. Uh, I think the startups are all still here. So does anyone have any questions for any of the startups that we've seen here today? Yes, right here in the front row. Who's your question for? For the, I think he was the f about uh, arthritis. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. that's you, Johannes. But but in a way, it's a question to all, as far as I can remember the question I had in Okay, mind, it okay. Goes back to prehistoric times. Okay. Uh, there he is. One, one percent. Yes. One percent occurrence is not a rare disease. It is a substantial amount. It's a serious issue. How is it that for ages this issue has not been properly addressed? I understand that maybe the technology was not as developed, but still it was a huge issue. And apparently you come in a, in a desert. Open market, yeah. yeah. And, and the same question applies to a lot of okay, others. Okay, like why have these solutions not existed before? It, it what, seems what that I am witnessing a, a, a revolution yes. in one or two hours here in this room, yeah. a revolution we had been right. waiting for for generations. Yeah, so Johannes, why do you think, uh, the, why is the time now and why is it, why is it happening with you guys right now? Yeah, so um, the, the, the issue has been the same. And there have been multiple solutions. So there was, for example, there was a spin out out of Philips, which is a major company, obviously, which did uh, thermal scanning. But the problem is that the studies did not, it was a different modality. So the, the studies do not confirm that the modality actually corresponds to the evaluation of rheumatologists. The other product that I actually showed as a competitor is a product that uses fluorescence. So you need an injection of contrast which automates the, the, the diagnosis. But again, it has a problem because it is a totally different modality and it has not been able to show really good results that it corresponds with the assessment of rheumatologists. That's exactly why when we developed the, you know, ARFR, we didn't want to change the modality. Uh, ultrasound is the gold standard modality, and we didn't want to reinvent that wheel. We just stuck with ultrasound and put robotics and AI on top, and we have the same modality. And that's actually sometimes why people accuse us of not being a breakthrough. And I think they don't understand that being a breakthrough is not necessarily about you know, creating something completely new. It's about solving a problem you know, in a really meaningful way. That's why I think we are a breakthrough, even though we haven't you know, developed a new modality. But there have been lots of modalities here. That's why everybody's staying here, is they okay. want the Samsung phone. Just leave it, on the, leave it right there. So does any other, uh, other startup want to answer this question? Why, like Marissa, for instance, would you like to answer the question that we have here in the front row, which is sure. why, why now, why hasn't this problem been solved now? Feel free to come back up. Yeah, so, um, I mean, AI hasn't been available. So, um, AI hasn't been available for many years, and obviously now, right now it is. Um, the, other, the other thing is, uh, I mean, related to, to pregnant women, Nobody really wants to touch them, you know, not physically, but nobody wants to do any work related to pregnant women. It's really hard to do trials, so a lot of the work is retrospective. Also, the algorithm models haven't been available to be able to do this. I mean, 10% of all women who deliver babies deliver them preterm. And that is actually, that's about 20 to 30% in the developing world. So there just hasn't been data, there hasn't been collaboration, there hasn't been this openness, um, unfortunately, to, to have that. So, um, you know, thank God for AI. So thank God basically that we can AI problems. and data has enabled this for this, the first time. For sure, for sure. I mean, there has been no other way to be able to solve all of these types of problems uh, until, until we even have data availability. Yeah. Yeah, and also these, you know, really large models to be able to compute very quickly as well. Right. That's the right. really important Resources part. Resources as well, yeah. of course. Great, thank you, Marissa. 
so uh, I think we're ready. Judges, we are ready? Okay. All right. So we're going to, yes. Interest is so uh, heat, going to make an announcement. Mm -hmm. But this is very close. I just mentioned that they're so close. To okay, them. okay. So I just received word that it's a very, very close competition here, uh, almost tied completely. So we're going to uh, welcome up uh, Mr. Seizo Oenea. He is the TSB director of ITU. Welcome. Yeah. And he's Hello. going to announce our lucky winner today. Oh, okay. Uh, firstly, I congratulate all the finalists today for their excellent achievement. Actually, we, I could see uh, great potential uh, for the, uh, each team's uh, uh, solutions for the sustainable development goals. And so I hope uh, you, all you uh, make the most use of this opportunity to expand your business. Congratulations. Then I'm very pleased to announce today's grand finale, grand yes. finale winner. Uh, yes, uh, okay. The winner is? The winner is Ultrasound AI. All right, Marissa. Congratulations, Marissa. How does it feel? <laughs> Congrats, Marissa, on that. Thank you. That. Uh, oh well, of course, I'll always, I'll always hold this one. Um, thank you, thank you, judges. That was really uh, unexpected. So thank you so much. Um, listen, women and babies deserve quality health care, and that's what we're very much trying to do. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.